But this is going to be an overview of America's second war with England, the Battle of 1812, or the War of 1812. Now, you have to understand that this really kind of have, has two dynamics. The first one that we're going to look at is America's issues in terms of how they relate to other foreign nations. If you think back to the Jefferson administration we talked about earlier, Jefferson was having some problems with both France and Britain concerning their kind of ongoing conflict, the fact that um, both of those nations were taking American ships, voiding United States neutrality, forcing these soldiers to serve on their ships. And Jefferson tries to deal with that by passing the Embargo Act of 1807. Now, we know that the Embargo Act of 1807 is something that doesn't go very well for America. So Jefferson is forced to rescind it in 1809 because the... U.S. economy takes such a hit. Well, after Jefferson leaves office, Madison, James Madison, who succeeds Jefferson, continues to deal with much of these same problems. And the impressment of American sailors on British ships resumes. And again, impressment just refers to British soldiers capturing American ships, taking those American sailors, and forcing them to serve on British ships. Because at the time, you know, obviously England wants to continue their dominance as a strong navy, and they have that little thing going on with themselves and with France, a little conflict between them. The second problem that they end up running into, America, is that we have problems domestically. We have some huge issues between ourselves and the Native Americans at this time. As America has continued to push west past the Appalachian Mountains, Natives have continued to fight back against it, especially as we continue to... Um, have a lot of uh, broken treaties on our end. And one of the individuals that's a key figure in all of this is the Shawnee leader named Tecumseh. Tecumseh had really been working for most of his adult life on trying to unite all of the Native American tribes on the continent under one banner. He actually got this as he studied the American Revolution and saw how the 13 states united themselves to fight England. So he travels as far south as Florida and as far west as North Dakota in order to, um, to try and do this. And the thing that really kind of irks Americans, because obviously we do have our conflicts with Native Americans, turns out when you try and take people's land, they have problems with it. But the issue that is going to relate this back to the War of 1812 is that the British, we get reports are kind of egging this on. They're supplying the natives, they're giving them weapons, they're helping their cause, and it's something that we continue to have some issues with. And the effort of Tecumseh to ally all the natives together um, takes a hit when William Henry Harrison is going to defeat Tecumseh's forces at the uh, Tippecanoe River um, with the Battle of Tippecanoe. And when the British you know, find that out, Tecumseh is forced really to come to them and ally himself. At that point, he, the British are their only option to save any of their homeland. So between the domestic problems that are going on and the foreign problems that are going on, we have this group of senators and congressmen that start to take hold and guys that we call war hawks. And these are guys who just want America to go to war with England. They're tired of the slights that they're being given both in the um, trade world, I mean, because the impressment of the American ships is not only an a insult to American honor, it really hurts our economy. And with the fact that they're stirring up problems on the frontier, these group of war hawks, Henry Clay, John C. Calhoun, and Langdon Chives, these guys want America to do something about it. So, and part of it, too, is they're starting to see this as their attempt to, you know, kind of further the country's um, expansion. You know, in their minds, you know, the, the predecessors or the guys who took care of the revolution um, have kind of moved on and it's now their time and they want to put their stamp on American history. So on June 1st of 1812, James Madison asks Congress and gets a declaration of war. And so that is the beginning of the War of 1812. Now the War of 1812 does not start off very good at all for the Americans. At the time, we only have 7,000 men in our military. And we only have about another fifty to 100,000 in militia. And that pales in comparison, again, to what the British have. 
We only have six naval warships. The British fleet has over 400. At the end of the day, our economy still really wasn't that strong. So we, things do not start out for us very well. We lose um, a number of early battles. Um, you know, at the Battle of Fort Niagara, 900 American troops are taken prisoner. The Battle of Detroit is really an insult um, to America. Detroit had become an American fort following um, the British evacuation of it after the American Revolution. And it was garrisoned by 2,000 Americans. Well, a British and Indian force that numbered less than 900 was able to force the Americans to surrender without ever even firing a shot. It was a basically the way they did it is they kind of spread themselves out and through a, a number of war cries and, and other things that they were able to do. They made the Americans think that they had um, three to four to five times the amount of soldiers that they actually had and the American garrison surrenders without ever fi even firing a shot. One of the few standouts during the War of 1812 is what happens at the Battle of Lake Erie um, with Oliver Hazard Perry. And it's probably the biggest naval victory the United States has at this point in its um, entire history. So Perry commanded a U.S. force at Lake Erie that consisted of nine ships. And the British um, commander, on the other hand, only had six ships. And the British did have an, an advantage early on. Um, their cannons had a much longer range of accuracy than what the Americans did. So obviously anytime you have a weapon that fires from further out and is more accurate, um, that puts you at an advantage. And Oliver Hazard Perry is actually on the Lawrence, which gets shelled so bad it eventually goes down, that he goes to the Niagara and just calls for the, the American ships to ram the British ships. Um... And it was one of those that it was kind of such a, a daring and bold move, it, the British weren't ready for it. And by that night, um, the British are forced to surrender. And that is our first major victory of the War of 1812. Now, even with that victory, uh, we still have a lot of problems. You know, the British are able to get to Washington, D.C. Remember, our military is nowhere near um, what we think of it as is today. And the British march 4,000 troops from the Chesapeake Bay into Washington, D.C. And as the British are marching um, into D.C., all they're met with is American militia. And at the end of the day, just like we saw many times in uh, the American Revolution, an American militia versus British regulars, it's not even really a contest. And they're able to easily defeat the... Um, American militia and really take total control of Washington, D.C. Um, and when they get to D.C., they end up setting fire to everything, including the president's mansion. Now, thankfully, and it's kind of a stroke of good luck for Americans, a very, very severe thunderstorm came in later that evening and eventually extinguished the fires much earlier than what they would have ever uh, extinguished without. And when they repainted the White House, the only color that was able to cover the um, burn marks that was left um, was white paint. So that is why our White House was painted white. Um, it's a result of what happened during the War of 1812. So um, that's where we get the name the White House. Now, one of the more memorable battles um, of the War of 1812 is what take place, takes place at Fort McHenry. And this is a little post right outside of Baltimore. And <clears throat> when the British get to Fort McHenry, they show up on September 13th and they just start unloading their heavy cannons on the fort. And they end up bombarding the fort for over 25 hours. And when the fort doesn't surrender after those 25 hours, they eventually decide um, it's going to be more than what they really feel like even trying to do. So they make the decision to leave the bay. Now, the Battle of Fort McHenry is actually memorialized by our national anthem, the Star Spangled Banner. Um, Francis Scott Key was actually on board the British ship um, trying to get one of his friends released. His friend had been taken prisoner um, earlier on. And when he sees what the British warships are starting to do to the fort, he realizes that there is a very high likelihood that when he wakes up in the morning he is going to see the British flag 
um, you know, above the, the fort. And when he wakes up on September 14th, he still sees the American flag flying, and he's so moved by what the garrison at Fort McHenry was able to do, he writes a poem called The Star-Spangled Banner. And in 1931, that poem gets ad adopted as our national anthem. Now, as this war um, ends up, it, it, at the end of the day, it, nothing really um, monumental is happening. Uh, you know, it's not anywhere like we talked about with the American Revolution, where you have you know a key battle that gets someone involved, or a key battle where we take out a lot of um, soldiers one way or the other. The War of 1812 really does not have anything like that. There's actually quite a bit of fighting that takes place um, on the frontier as well. But the thing the British are, are involved with is a war with France as well. They're fighting the Napoleonic Wars in Europe. So the British government is looking at this situation in America and it basically comes to the conclusion that there's no point in continuing this war. And so as a result, both parties meet in Belgium to negotiate a, a truce. So we signed the Treaty of Ghent on December 24th of 1814, and this ends the War of 1812. This is arguably the most meaningless treaty in world history. Nothing changed. No land change hand, no borders were adjusted, uh, the impressment of sailors was basically a non-entity anymore as England had moved um, and basically handled things with France, so they didn't need to take American sailors anymore. Um, so the Treaty of Ghent basically is nothing more than an agreement between the United States and the British to say, okay, we're done fighting. However, we do not let that treaty prevent us from having what is easily the most famous battle of the War of 1812, and that's the battle that takes place at New Orleans. Now, General Andrew Jackson um, had been a pretty key figure in the American military up to this point. Um, he had fought one of the um, more notable battles in the South, the Battle of Horseshoe Bend, um, where he was able to defeat a large number of um, Creek natives um, who were huge allies to the British. And Jackson shows up... Um, to New Orleans in early December of 1814. Now, the fighting takes place on January 8th. The fighting does take place. This battle is totally fought after the, surrender, the signing of the Treaty of Ghent. Now, Jackson had chosen a, a very swampy area to make his stand, and he wins easily America's most decisive victory over the British. He only ends up having like 71 um, casualties during this battle, and he inflicts a massive amount, a, a casualty list of over 1,500 against British soldiers. And this battle, this victory, is at least able to get America to have a sense of feeling that we won this, instead of it just being a draw. Um, this is, allows us to feel something good about it. And it's particularly critical as Jackson, we see memorialized here um, in this painting, becomes a key figure on down the road because Jackson is going to use his success at places like New Orleans and just as a general in, in American military to, to catapult himself to the American presidency. And his presidency is going to be um, one of the more important times in American history when you start looking at some of the items that Jackson is going to have. So the, the Battle of New Orleans, even though it has zero bearing on the outcome of the War of 1812 uh, is important in two reasons. One, because of the um, positive feeling it does give many Americans of Jackson defeating the British in such a you know monumental way. And two, it, it's huge for the career of Andrew Jackson. So that's going to wrap up our discussion of the War of 1812 for this video lecture.